Good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us this evening for a very special Restless event on why being over 50 is the time to foster with Restless partner Capstone Foster Care. Capstone Foster Care are committed to doing all they can to build brighter futures for children and young people up and down the country by providing their foster carers with the very best local support and extensive training. I'm delighted to welcome Lucy Weber, fostering advisor team lead and Lynn Blenko, who has been fostering for many years and has helped to change the lives of so many young people. Just some housekeeping before we get started. The event will run for an hour and Lucy and Lynn are very happy to answer your questions throughout the presentation. Just unmute yourself using the button on the bottom left or your or, or your screen of your screen or post a question in the chat function if you prefer to do it that way. There will also be time for a Q&A at the end. This event will be recorded for those who are unable to attend. So without further delay, I'd like to hand over to Lucy to start the evening's event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, I am Lucy Weber, as you've already been told. I'm a foster and advisor team leader here at Capstone Foster Care. Um, and my role is to manage a team of foster and advisors who you would speak to as your first point of contact um, if anyone wishes to become a foster carer. So um, we'll talk through more about the process later on. Um, but the reason that we're here today, um, myself and Lynn, in fact, Lynn, would you like to introduce yourself before I carry yeah, on? Yeah, of course. Good evening, everyone. It's so lovely to see so many people and I can't wait to, to share what I do all day, every day and what I've been doing for the last 44 years with my husband. Um, between us, we've looked after 93 children. And I absolutely love being a foster carer. I've done all sorts of jobs. I've been in a police, I've, I've worked in a prison, I've taught tap dancing, I've done all sorts of things. But the one thing that gives me the most joy has been being a foster carer. Thank you, Lynn. And I'm sure Lynn will share some of her inspirational stories and experiences that she's had over the last 44 years. Um, she'll have lots to talk about relating to fostering. Um, what I would say, um, as Adine mentioned, if you've got a question, pop it in the chat. If I miss it, it's just because I'm busy talking away, um, but I will endeavour to answer any or, or Adine will, will put me in and, and um, ask the question. Um, so today we're here to talk about the advantages um, and qualities that you may have as members of Restless and being over 50. So why fostering suits over 50s? Um, so there is no upper age limit to become a foster carer. Um, we do an assessment. We make sure that for your own um, well, duty of care to you as well, that everybody is fit and healthy. But that goes for any age. Whoever goes through a fostering assessment, they have to have a, a medical check. Um, the minimum age is 21. Obviously, um, being older may have lots of different advantages um, when you are fostering. So our average age of a foster carer here at Capstone is 56. Um, so that tells you, obviously being older, you may have more time on your hands. You've certainly got more life experiences and you may be at an age where you're not working full time. Um, you may be working part time or not be working at all. So that will give you the availability to become a foster carer. And I was literally just I was watching the news before I came on here. And um, there was a, a it was on ITV news about age discrimination for the old over 50s. Well, I can reassure you that that is certainly not the case um, for fostering and fostering recruitment. Lucy, can I just say, we, we've had a message to say, can people please make sure they're muted if they're not speaking? So we're getting oh. a little bit of background noise from somebody. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Um, so yeah, obviously being, being older or for any age, having a good support network is really important when, you, when you're fostering. Um, you would, when you are approved, you nominate somebody to be your person of support. So if ever you need a babysitter, um, it might be that you want a night out. It might be that you've got an appointment that you couldn't take a child to. Um, 
then you've got somebody that's had that DBS check and they're your nominated person and that they can look after the child on your behalf. So don't feel that you're alone. I will to also talk about support from within Capstone as well. Um, so another thing, once, once you're claiming your pension, if you're fostering, because it's classed as an allowance rather than a salary, it wouldn't affect um, your, your pension and tax relief. So that's something else to bear in mind. And obviously, if you do have that as an income, um, then that is a regular income. If you've got enough money coming into your home that will support yourselves financially, then that's great. The way that fostering works is that you get fees paid to you per child um, when you have a child living with you. So if you did have gaps in the placements, you're not receiving those fees. So if you've got another income and you are financially independent yourself, then that's a bonus. So Lucy, can I just can I just talk about um, support? Absolutely. So, um, I, I have two lovely, lovely birth sons. And one of them lives in a little annex next door to me, and they're my support. So uh, my husband and I make sure that we we do all the things that 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 keep us to be our, our you know the, the people that we are. So one of my main hobbies I, I sing, I sing barbershop, and I go away. I went away to Sweden um, recently in a European competition. My husband likes to go and do things with with trains, and it's really important that all the things that you do that make you 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 carry on doing. So that's why you have your support group round because uh, yeah you, you still need to do all those lovely things so my son I've got two two sons both of those are my backup carers so it's it's really easy my son just moves into the house and looks after the children while we go away and we go away for we we take the children away we have a lovely two-week holiday in Lanzarote but equally next year it's one of my husband's big birthdays and we're going to Africa for two weeks so wow. my son will come and move in and look after the children so it's really important that you carry on your life. You do all the exciting things that, that make you you. Yeah, and important oh, there as well, Lynn. No, thank you, is you can do that. Just because you're fostering, it doesn't, life doesn't stop. Um, you you can, you have the ability. There is ways around it. You also get two weeks paid respite as a foster carer. So if, for example, Lynn mentioned she's going on holiday, if there wasn't anyone available to look after the child, um, obviously you've got a very good support network around you there, Lynn. Mm -hmm. The child will go to an alternative foster carer for the duration. So you get that every year. Okay. Something else, um, another reason for, for doing this um, webinar is um, by 2025, there is subjected to be about 100,000 children in need of foster care, which unfortunately means that we could be 25,000 foster carers short. Um, obviously, those children in care for a reason um people seem to have stopped fostering or not applying as much as they were and this could be for a variety of reasons i would say that since covid um since the pandemic people have the inquiry numbers went down so we're obviously very eager to support and help these children who will still need the care I think one of the things, Lucy, it, it's, it's because of COVID. If people had a spare bedroom, yeah. um, they would maybe have thought about being fostering, but then so many people decided to have that as a home office. Absolutely. So a group of people that would have maybe considered it haven't yeah. been able to do that. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's nobody's, well, nobody's fault. It's just the way it mm. is. And obviously, as an agency that is so passionate about children and, and caring for children, we need to do all that we possibly can to reach out to people who would be ideal candidates. And there's lots of people out there who would be. And to raise awareness of fostering. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen the, the John Lewis Christmas advert. Um, if you haven't, it is a fostering family and it is yeah. so touching and heartwarming that um, it's a guy on a skateboard, if you see it, and he's learning to ride his skateboard. And at the end of the advert, there's a young girl who comes to the door with a skateboard under her arm and that that's her new fostering family. 
So it's very, very touching, very poignant. And it's just what the fostering industry needs just to raise that awareness um, and make people aware that fostering is an option for them. And it's about connection. It's, it's showing the importance. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't just look after children. We, we, we love them. We, we embrace all of their hobbies their way of life and and this chap he's got he's gone out of his way to learn to skateboard so as soon as she knocks on the door they've got a connection straight away it, it's Absolutely. it's really lovely and and it's mm -hmm. it's not so much of an advert for John Lewis I think it, it's it's an awareness broadcast and they've done yeah. a fantastic job yeah they have they have um so fostering I don't know how much or how little you know about fostering so it's basically when a child will come and live with you in your stable family home environment and you would care for that child as if they were your own. It's to give them that safe and secure and stable environment, which obviously they may have been lacking um, in the, in, within their family home. Children can obviously be in foster care for a variety of reasons. It could be that there's issues going on at home. It could be that they're waiting for an adoptive family. Um, issues could, could be, you know, abuse, neglect, financial issues. The parents could be ill. They may be in hospital and they're in, and they're or they're unable to care for them. So a temporary arrangement needs to be made to make sure that that child is safe and secure. So as a foster carer, you would nurture them, treat them as your own, um, obviously role model. I'm sure, Lynn, you can share some of your experiences. These children are in foster care because they have experienced trauma, but they need that love, that care, the attention, the patience of somebody and just to feel loved. Yeah, I think that the, um, the, the number one reason that children come into care is through neglect. Mm -hmm. And just by being a, a stable family, a reliable family, a family where the adults are in charge, we can just make so much difference. And all the things you said we do, Lisa, we do, but we have fun. Yeah. Oh my goodness, we have fun. So yeah. just this last week, you know, though we were at the cinema, Wakanda Forever, I don't know if anybody's seen the Black Panther 2 film, but it was really good. We were there the week before we were seeing Lyle, Lyle Crocodile. And, and my little one, I, I call him little, he's, he's 12. Um, his autistic moderate learning difficulties, he was laughing so loud. He actually shoots up off, off his bottom oh. in the cinema, laughing so much. It was infectious. And it's just, it's it's just really heartwarming to see. Yeah. How Does anybody have any questions, I wonder, Lucy? Because if you've got anything burning you want to say or want to ask, please, please do. We're, we're really, really keen to be giving you the information. We've got presentation, but we really want to hear if there's any particular questions that you want. Talk. yeah no questions a silly question just please ask yeah. away if you if you want to chat chat if you want to pop it in the in the chat meeting chat then please feel free to do so at any point um so fostering it may be a few hours it may be a few months there's different lengths of placements so we work closely with the local authorities um as local authorities make referrals to us, we would then, as we get to know our families very well in a fostering assessment, we would make an appropriate match because you foster as a family. So we have a duty of care to you and your family. We want this to work. We want these children to have that stability and to have a family home where they're happy. So we would match that child with you. During a fostering assessment, we also speak to your family and we will say you foster as a family. It's not just a foster carer, you foster as a family. Um, we would speak to your, your children, um, the whole family's involved in that fostering assessment and when we match the child with you. If you had a preference to age of child, we would consider your preferences, but we'd ask you to be open to all ages because a specific age may not be what's right for your family. And you know, we've had requests before for children of the same age as their own children. That may, may or may not work. 
Sometimes if it is a similar age child, there might be a clash. Um, and I've had people with young children say they only they don't want teenagers. But I ask them to consider, I'll always ask why and consider what the benefits could be. You could have a teenager who would like to sit down and read a story and play with your young child. It may be that an older child although they are older, because of the their experiences that they've had, they may present as younger, so they may get on um, with the children, enjoy that playtime. So we would consider the whole family and how that would work. So that's why we would ask people to be open. Lucy, can I say that the child, so we've looked after 93 children, and the child that had the most um, behaviour that was challenging to deal with was a seven-year-old. Yeah. And some of the teenagers that we've had have been absolutely lovely and they cook your dinner for you which is always a bonus <laughs> always, always a bonus so you just can't go on the age of the child you know please don't be thinking that teenagers are going to be tricksy and cause you trouble because it's just yeah not the case and it's about it's about um the situations that the children have, have have come from rather yeah. than their actual age and for so many of our young people as well they they do function at a chronologically younger age anyway mm -hmm. because of what they've been through so yeah. be really can i just about, ask about what... can i just ask a quick question in there yes Please do. Um, Melanie. i actually come from a very large family of seven children although we're spread all over the world these days i have a couple of sisters locally but i am my i have three sons myself one of which is here the other two live in in america um but I am not a family anymore. I've just hit 60. I'm here on my own. I have some love, time, energy and enthusiasm to give. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, um, because you keep, I mean, I can see that. I would, personally, I would rather put my child, not that I ever would, in with a family and I can see all the reasons why, but it didn't occur to me I'm not a family anymore. Mm -hmm. You absolutely, you absolutely would be would be a family. You know, yeah. we, not only can you um, foster as a as a single person, you are warmly welcome to foster yeah. as as a single person. I probably about a third of our foster carers. About am I about right, Lucy? About a third, at least a quarter to a third, are single parents. Absolutely, it makes sense because you've got that undivided time and attention and focus to give to them. It makes yes. sense. absolutely, and there's some of our young people that absolutely need that, and they and they can't be matched in a family with with children. Definitely, and certainly they, they can't need be matched one in a family one. with young children. Yeah. They need one to one. Yeah, so okay. absolutely. Not only isn't it a bar, you would be warmly, warmly welcome. Okay, thank you. That's why people of of, of any age, you know, we, it's not just oh well, you can do it if you're over fifty. You are warmly invited. I was talking to somebody who was 86 the other day who was who was considering starting fostering. Wow. You know what? If you've got the energy, you've got the enthusiasm, you've got absolutely. absolutely. Well, actually, one of the reasons I, I, I do yoga four times a week is to keep physically fit for my grandson. So, you know. Oh. Yeah. And that's, you know, once you've you are a family, as Lynn quite rightly said, but once you've got that child living with you, you're a fostering family. And that's why we refer to you as a fostering family. But yes, quite rightly so. There are some children who they, they may be solo placements, which means that, that it's not appropriate to place them alongside another child. Okay, yeah. And the one to one would be absolutely beneficial to them. Okay. Lucy, we've had another question about do you have to have had birth children before you foster? That's absolutely not. Absolutely not. You are you are warmly welcome. Anybody is warmly welcome to apply. You know, we need for the for the, the different children that we have, children and young people that need foster parents, we need this wider range of foster parents that we can have. Yeah. So we warmly welcome single people, we warmly may warmly welcome people who are married who are in civil partnerships who are in same-sex couple relationships you know we we want as wide and as a diverse um, group of people to foster as we can yeah absolutely I and mean, we another question we get asked talking about families um is you know i've got dogs can i foster with dogs who are obviously part of the family absolutely yes um, as long as they're good around children of course but pets can be therapeutic mm -hmm. um so obviously they don't answer your back do they so that's that's a, a benefit it can be a benefit obviously there's things that like allergies we have to consider 
um, but most certainly if dogs and I'm sure you must have children with fear of dogs as well fear of animals so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And that would all be, it's all part of the assessment and that would all be considered when matching a child with you and getting the right fam fostering family for that mm. child to make it I work. would say the majority of foster carers have pets of some sort and yeah. most of those have dogs. Yeah, most mm. of us just do. Rachel, I can see you've got a little cute one just popped his head up. <laughs> cute. Oh. Jack of our. Very cute. Very cute. <laughs> It's just cold, so he was sitting on my lap to keep warm. Oh, they keep you warm as well, then, don't they? <laughs> um, so, if you are working still, that's absolutely fine. What we would ask is that you have the availability to foster alongside your job. So, your job is your commitment. Um, people have work different hours. They have different demands with their job. Um, as long as you're available enough to meet the children's needs. So obviously we're thinking about school runs here. You need to be able to get the child to school and to pick them up. Um, there may be meetings that you'd need to attend, whether that be at the school. They may have family time where the child will go visit their birth family. Um, there may be medical appointments. Training at Capstone, we offer a, a really good training package and social worker visits. So as long as you can work the two together alongside each other, then that's absolutely fine. We get sorry. people, sorry. Sorry, could I ask a question about employers? Uh, yes. I haven't looked into this. Are they, are employers generally obliged to be flexible when it comes to fostering or is that not a national policy of any kind is it up to the individual um, employer it's up to the individual employer and obviously the the type of job that you have and um the demands of your job obviously when it, if if you had a doctor's appointment most employers will allow you to go to the doctors with your own child but there are more meetings with with when you're fostering um the issue is that unless a child in foster care is already in a, a holiday club after school club breakfast club then you can't choose to put them in there for you to go to work yeah. as their foster carer you're getting getting the fees to support that child so the expectation is and to give them that stability that you you are that person that takes them and picks them up from school and school holidays are a big thing because obviously they get 13 weeks off um, and you'd be very lucky to get 13 weeks annual leave unless you're a teacher of course mm -hmm. um, but yeah so it's just making sure that you've got that availability and that it's going to work for you um, and your mm -hmm. employer. I didn't know if there was any sort of national framework whereby employers were obliged to um, make allowances for foster caring or if, if there's no obligation on employers at all. I think is There's it, not, but wouldn't it be a good idea? It yeah. would, yeah. but I know that Sainsbury's, for example, they encourage foster care, so they are very, very flexible. So there may be other companies out there like that that will support foster carers. So I, it's I bet John Lewis would as well, because John Lewis have, have, have made some brilliant pledges to be supporting yeah. care experienced young people. We've, yeah. got a question, we've got a question up. So would a foster child change schools to be closer to the foster home? Initially, what would happen is when the child gets removed, say, from their birth family, they'll have been removed from their family, their friends, everything they know. So unless there was a really good reason, the child would remain at their school until it was decided what the outcome of the child would be. Because it's possible, because everybody, everybody wants to work towards the child being back with their birth family, if at all possible. That, that's what the law says and that's what's morally right if they can go back to the family then let's do that so what you don't want to do is move the child okay the child comes to to live with me we move schools and then six months later child goes back to the birth family and the child moves back again so yeah. we'd really try and avoid that so part of the matching process is let's say the child lives i don't know let's say in the center of birmingham they'd be looking within an area around the child's school to start yeah. with obviously there might be reasons why the child can't stay at the school let's say the birth family live 
in the next street and there might be some difficulties there, then the child would move. But usually the child would stay there because then they've got the stability of school, they've got their school friends and they've got the support of their, their teachers. Yeah, if it's in their best interest to move them, then they may be moved. So, for example, if it was a long term placement, that child was yeah. going to be living with you up until they reach the age of 18. They're not getting on at school. The distance is, is an issue. Um, then it would be a decision um, with the local authorities that that child yeah. would be able to move to a more local school to you. Yeah, in fact, that would almost definitely happen, wouldn't it? Once, the, once yeah. it's decided where the child's going to be long term. Yeah then the child moves. Absolutely. Um, and do we cover all the areas in, in the UK? Most of them, Lucy, don't we? We do. We've got six registrations across the UK. Um, we have the Midlands team, the South East team, the South West team, the North team, and then we have, a, we're part of an agency called Excel, and they're a, um, Lancashire and Blackpool, and then Foster Care UK, which is down in the South East as well. So there are areas that we may not cover, but we do cover most areas. We don't cover Scotland or Wales or Newcastle area. We don't go that far north. Yes. There's, there's not a many that we don't cover. Um, so with regards to criteria, um, we've already spoken about being no upper age limit, just being fit and healthy. Um, you need to have a spare bedroom available. So the foster child cannot sleep, even if it's a baby, they cannot sleep in the same room as you, that you have to have a spare bedroom. Um, and so before we can start any assessment, that needs to be in place. Are there many babies? Well, it used to be a definite no. With an independent fostering agency, it was a no because we just don't get the referrals. What we did see happen is the local authorities would tend to place the babies first because they're more likely to be adopted and they're easier to place. Um, but the local authorities only have a certain amount of fostering families and social workers to support those families. So because now of the... the um, shortage of foster carers we're finding that we are getting some referrals through for babies because they still need care so it used to be a no but gradually that's increasing mm. and it can depend and also but we get more parent and child referrals now yes because of, of, of finances lots of the um, assessment units have closed down now um, yeah. and so whereas a parent and child traditionally a mother and child but sometimes it's a father and child would have gone into an assessment unit to, to be assessed for say maybe um, three months. Those places aren't available. And so increasingly they're coming to foster carers to be part of the assessment process. I can see that Mark's asked about expenses for health treatment. So braces, for example. I, you, you get your foster an allowance, which is to cover all expenses for that foster child. Have you ever had that experience, Lynn, where a child does need some braces? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, if it's not been covered by the National Health Service, then the local authority have paid. There we go. Yeah, it's not something that we would pay for. I think it would be done on a case by case basis. I mean, your, your fostering allowance um, is more for feeding, clothing, if the child goes to any clubs, um, expense, daily expenses to support that child, um, any extras. You'd speak to, you have a social worker, so you'd speak to your supervising social worker and the local authority, and that would be arranged. Um, is there lots of paperwork involved because of, you know, constant reporting back, updating, all that type of thing? What so, we have to do is we, we do a recording once a week on an electronic system called Charms. But to be honest, like I'm just thinking about my little one. He just does what everybody else does. So there's separate mm -hmm. headings. So the top one is health. And if his health is all good, you just write all good. If he's been to the dentist for a checkup, you just write dentist checkup. That's it. On to the next question. Education. This week, scientist of the week. Yeah, that's why I would highlight that. That's it. And so most of our children are just doing what children do. You know, um, if there was a safeguarding issue, let's say uh, that um, 
one of them had been in hospital, broken his leg, then of course you would have to report that straight away. But then when you go on your weekly reporting, you just say, Billy broke his leg, email refers. So my reports at the end of the week honestly take me no more than 10 minutes. And you've got two, two children, haven't you? And I've got two, two young people, yeah. yeah. Because anything that's gone on, I'll, I'll have written about that separately. But to be honest, 99% of our children are just doing what children do. They get up, they go to school, they come back, they go to their after school clubs, they play Lego, they watch a bit of TV and they go to bed. Rinse Eat. and repeat and at the weekend <laughs> we go off and do things. They're not running away, they're not setting fire to anything, they're not stabbing anybody, they're just being children. So there isn't anything to, re to report, but we do record uh, once a week. Yeah, and, and you know, these children, the fostering is obviously a temporary arrangement. We've got short term and we've got long term and sometimes respite as well. Um, some placements may be shorter than others. If it's an emergency placement, it might just be for a matter of days or a couple of weeks. But these children may have or may move around to different families. Yeah. As a child, we tend to ask our parents who remind us of our experiences. Whereas if it's all logged, it's like a diary. So they, they know mm. they've got those memories to look back on because you can put positive things in the reports, can't you, Lynn? You know, if something you've Always. done is exciting. And um, so it's like a, a diary and, and a memory box, really, for them to be able to recall um, or yeah. talk about what they've done. Yeah, that's the biggest section is what, mm. what activities to be done this week. And especially mm. if you've been away on holiday, you know, so we had two weeks in Lanzarote, which was amazing. And on this day, we did this and this day, we did that. And although the children with me, um, one's been with me seven years and the other one's been with me 10 years. So they are really long term, stable place here. Um, but children that do move on, you're right, Lucy, they they sometimes, you know, they can have many, many foster carers and they, they forget what they've done. Yeah. Sorry. Is there a uh, what a, is there an age range recommended for caregivers who have had kids but are new to fostering? Is that an age range of children, I'm, I'm wondering, or an age range for caregivers? If it's an age range recommended for children, of children, absolutely not, because you could get a 15 year old who is the, the most charming, the most lovely. They go to they catch the bus to school. Um, they go off and do their clubs, they're doing their Duke of Edinburgh Award, they're going off swimming. The amount of our children that are in things like um, sea cadets or air cadets. So it, it, it really all depends. Or you might get a four-year-old that, that's an absolute, you know, absolute dream. It, you, you just can't focus on the age of the child. It's about the behavior of the child and the, and the, the, the trauma that they've had. That's so, what I'm thinking when I, that, that's what I was thinking when I was referring to reporting. Because obviously the, pos uh, the positive aspect of what it is you're talking about, and you, you said diary box, and for them to actually refer to. So this is some kind of public record for them as a continuation. But I'm thinking about the responsibility of the foster carer for highlighting concerns and anxieties that the child may have under the assumption mm -hmm. that these are foster children and that lots of aspects of their life are not normal. Mm -hmm. And that... Um, as you go through and, and these things are highlighted to you um, about these child, about, you know, each specific child, where's the platform that you discuss, report, right. inquire, you know, where's that? So, so once a month we have supervision. So the children will have their own social worker from the local authority. And as foster carers with Capstone, we have our own supervising social worker. So that social worker's job is to make sure that we are doing what we're supposed to be doing and we can offload to them. So once a month, they'll come and see us and they'll sit down with an agenda. How's it going? Any concerns, anything? And they'll know if there's concerns because you will have already written it in your, in your report. Okay, so that's and the that's social the worker's time. responsibility, not the care, the, the agency that you are. I see the continuity reason for the diary now. Okay, all right. So it's yeah, not, yeah. not so you guys so, at all, so, it's a social worker. The supervising social worker is almost holding us to account and supporting us. But okay. more than once a month that we have a 24 hour helpline and you can phone up any time of the day. Let's say you had a child, let's say you have a teenager, you said you've got to be home at nine, 10 past nine, they're not home and you're thinking, oh, I don't know, or shall I phone the police? Shall I, they're probably around their friends, don't know what to do. 
then you phone out of hours then out of hours will tell you exactly what you need to do and it could be has this child gone you know or, or have they been late a few times and if you say well yeah last week they were late three times but i know they were around their friends around the corner they might leave they might say give them another five minutes and then we'll you know we'll have another chat but if it's my child is never ever late and i'm really worried then they might give you the advice right you need to phone the police and you need to do all of these things so there is always somebody there out of hours to help you and any time during the you know during office hours you can contact your supervising social worker and they'll give you advice and if they're not available there'll be somebody on duty that can talk to you so you don't wait for your once a month supervision if there's anything going on at all or you need to ask any question then you speak to a social worker from Capstan and then they'll give you advice and that is solid is it the comeback on that is is time specific is it because but, there's, well, there's one thing winging these things with your own child there's nowhere else to default to but for this and the responsibility of that that's solid that there you will always get an answered phone call within a timely manner will you out of hours there's only I, I phoned out of hours a few times and there's only once when they've already been on another call and they call me straight back okay absolutely and it's a real person it's not like a you know press button a and you know wait for 25 minutes there is a real person and then I would always follow that up with an email I would always say thank you so much for speaking to me la 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 the advice you gave me was this 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 and I would copy my social worker in but I know that the out of hours person will have done the same thing they will have copied my social worker in. So the next morning, my social worker opens up the emails and says, oh, wow, Lynn had a tricky time last night. I'm going to give her a ring. I, and I can honestly say that the support from Capstan is amazing. It is really brilliant. You're not on your own. Because you'd say it's a really huge responsibility. If Absolutely. something goes wrong, I don't want anybody saying, well, Lynn, that was a dodgy old decision you made there. Yeah. I want to be able to say, well, I've discussed it with the social worker and as a team, this was what was decided. Yeah. And the team, there's a team around the child, but there's also a team around us to keep us safe and make sure that we are making the right decisions. Absolutely. Any doubt at all, pick up. So you can pick up and you can talk to a social worker, but you can also talk to another foster carer. So I'm a peer mentor for the Midlands and I get foster carers phoning me up all the time saying, I don't really want to bother my social worker because they, you know, I just don't want to. What do you think? And I'll say, well, do you know what? I think you definitely need to be phoning your social worker about that. Or I might give them other bits of advice, but I'm just another foster carer that they can talk to as somebody that does, does the job just the same as they do. So there's lots of support. We also have support groups, which are once a month where we get together. And it's lovely for support uh, for carers just to get in the same room and say, I've had a great week. What about you? Oh, I've had a tricky one. And there will always be somebody that has dealt with something. You can have a room full of foster carers and there won't be one thing that nobody else has dealt with. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. off each other. yeah. Like yeah. It's really important. Room, yeah. It's really important that you don't feel isolated and that you are part of a team and you are something much bigger mm. and you do get real proper support. What you find with with Capstone, we have a very low ratio of um, foster carers to social workers. So at the moment, it's only about one to eight families, one social worker to eight, between eight and 10 families. Um, there are local authorities for one. I know that they can, I've heard as, as many as one to 40 families in the past. Um, yeah. I would hope that it's better than that now. <laughs> our supervising social workers have got more time for you they're more responsive to your calls and there is always someone there that you can speak to no 24 7 365 days yeah. and there's somebody there that you can talk to okay thank you um so the role of a foster carer um is to provide um, a stable home 24 7 so obviously you've got that child coming and living with you and your family OK, which is a positive. You can get to know them really well. They can get to know you and you can give them that stability um, to ensure that they're accessing education um, and medical appointments if needed. Um, maintain or try to maintain relationships between that foster child and their birth family. So I mentioned earlier when I was talking about commitments in fostering that if there may be an arrangement that the child has weekly contact, monthly contact. It might be twice a week. It may be in a support centre. It may be in a, a public place. 
but it's your responsibility to get them there, to keep those relationships with their family. Because as Lynn said, in an ideal world, the, the best thing for the child is to be at home or to get into a position where they can return home to their family. Um, to promote the child's uh, identity, so that whether that's religion, sexuality or culture. Um, so a question that we get asked a lot is about cultural matches with, with children and families. Sometimes, again, I'll talk about the matching process again, it makes sense to, to match that child within a family of the same culture who practice the same religion sometimes it doesn't work it's a not a good thing so again we've we best child's best interests at heart what's best for them and if it's that that child is in a safe and secure environment then that that will be the best for them but as a foster carer if they did practice a certain faith or culture um then then we would ask you to support that child um, and support the child towards independence. And to, one day that child is going to go out into the big wide world. Um, they're in foster care till they reach the age of 18. And, you know, it's, it's a big thing for them if they go into supported living or com live completely independently. Um, so teach them those skills, the life skills that they need, cooking, cleaning, how to, to keep personal hygiene, um, which they may have not had those been taught to them previously. Lynn, have you got, um, is one of your boys a stay and put placement? Yeah, yeah, he is, yeah. yeah. So back in the day, for those of us old enough to remember that, our children used to leave care at 16. Can't imagine that now. No. And then it changed to 18. Um, and although at 18, that any care orders uh, are then revoked and they become adults, if it's in the young person's best interest and they want to, and it suits you as well, they can stay with their previous foster carers under a scheme called staying put. So my lovely young person is staying with us under staying put, uh, and they can do that until they're 21. So he's 21 in January, but because he's got special needs, he's then going to be with us under something called shared lives, which is, which is like an adult placement, really. It's, like, it's a bit like adult fostering but he's going to be staying with us as long as he wants to, really. So we have a, a we have a, a loose plan that by 25, he might want to go and live with some of his friends with similar needs, and they'll live in some sort of supported housing. But at the moment, he's really happy here with us. I absolutely love having him here with us. You met him briefly earlier, didn't you? Uh, yes. Lucy, and, uh, and, wonderful. And absolutely wonderful. He's been part of our lives for 10 years, and I just can't imagine life without him. And he will be part of our lives forever and ever. And when my husband and I are no longer around, then my birth sons will be part of his family forever because, mm -hmm. because he's their brother. So, oh, yeah. amazing. I'm pleased he's staying, Lynn. I didn't realise that. I'm really pleased about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and you've just touched on something actually that's that's made me think. Some we get a lot of people inquire who are concerned about saying goodbye to the child, mm. Um, mm. because obviously you're caring for that child twenty four seven. They may have been with you for a while, and then they move on. Um, you are supported with your supervising social worker, and this is what fostering is. Fostering is a temporary arrangement unless it's a long, longer term, like Lynn's just mentioned. And for that child to go back to their family or onto their forever home, we have to think of that as a positive outcome. Mm. Have you experienced that, Lynn? Because in all of your placements, have you experienced the sadness? Yeah, I mean, of course, sometimes um, children do go back to their birth family mm. and it hasn't been the right thing, you know, with hindsight. Mm -hmm. the, the, the right decision wasn't made and then you see that the, the child back in the situation that they were in mm -hmm. that can be really tough yeah um, what percentage do go back to their origins very very very, very few yeah very, very few I had a, a a lovely lovely girl all my children have lovely been noticed but they really are they really are <laughs> um and it's what you had, make them um, with Oh, she, she had quite um, specific special needs and her mum was just exhausted and a bit of a safeguarding issue. So this little girl came to live with us for six months and I was in contact, a constant contact with her mum, who was absolutely brilliant. She showed me how to look after this little girl. She showed me how to communicate with her. 
and the mum did the work that she needed to do and then at the end of the six months the little girl went back to live with mum and they all live happily ever after absolutely amazing and we still exchange Christmas cards and and she's doing really well and that was fantastic that was fantastic but but usually not you know usually children once they've gone so child gets removed and then that there'll be a court process usually and then at the end of that so that's short-term fostering where when the decision is being made what's what's going to happen to the child what's in the child's best interest and then that can take up to about two years so short-term fostering is up to about two years and then at court they'll decide and if it's gone that long it's very very rare that the child will, will go back to their birth family and the court will then decide whether or not it's adoption or uh, special guardianship or long-term fostering. And often the children will end up staying with the foster carers if it's working. And, and you know, by then the children have been with you for two years, then that, that tends to be what happens. Yeah, they wouldn't they wouldn't move them away if it's working, would they? If they've got that stability no. settled, you, you're happy as yeah. a family, then yeah. they could potentially stay with you. Yeah. But there's no doubt sometimes it is really hard when children move on. It's yeah. really it's 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 really hard. Or because sometimes, we're, human. You know, we're all human, aren't course. we? And have feelings. But it of is course. that bit about having them come to you for concerns that they were taken away in the first place. And then their their original parents, parent, whoever it is, um, ups their game and the circumstances come about that having got this child settled secure safe and past this point to return Mm -hmm. them back to those sets of circumstances that you Mm -hmm. feel are likely to come again must be incredibly difficult especially if you've seen growth in that child in between there would be very 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 rare to be honest yeah and the social workers involved and if they thought that it wasn't safe or the right thing for that child to return home then they wouldn't they would they would remain in long-term care it has to be right for them to go back home and and there has to be hope as well so you get you might get a situation where um a a parents a a mother's have a a baby removed due to domestic violence in the home and it could be that the mum's managed to get out of that relationship she's now got a relationship with a stable partner life is really good and there's no reason why a child shouldn't go back to her yeah. So in that in that situation, you would you would want that to happen. You would want the child mm-hmm. to be with her with her birth family if at all possible. Mm. Yeah, it it it's very rare that it happens that they do go back to be honest. So qualities, um, and you can see some of these in Lynn. Um, so to to be a foster carer, what we would say is that you have a good sense of humor and you have life experience, lots of energy um you want to help an advocate for children so obviously there's meetings to go to you're you're their advocate you're there to speak on that child's behalf and offer them that support have your good support network around you which we've spoken about patience and resilience which I think is a good one because obviously the children that have have experienced this trauma when they might be um angry or shouting it's not a personal thing and it's to see through that behavior to accept them as they are and to understand them um to adapt and be flexible and work part of us as a team which is what we are Mm. at capstone we all work together we're all very supportive um and and you'll find within whichever region you would come under everybody knows each other our region our regional managers know the foster carers by names um and then you know with the support groups you've got the opportunity to go in the office and speak to um other people other carers social workers the managers so we we do class ourselves as as being a real family feel agency we're not a massive agency we're not a small agency but where we are we are we have a good structure and we have the ability to to really get to know our carers because we're not too big Um, types of fostering I have touched on this um, but if anyone's got any questions about it please drop them in the chat or ask out loud so emergency foster care is if a child is removed um, unexpectedly at 
it could be any time of day. Um, then and they need somewhere to stay until a more permanent fostering arrangement is found for them. Um, so that could be, you know, a couple of weeks, it could be a couple of days, it could be overnight or just for a few hours. Um, but that would be classed as an emergency placement. It wouldn't be uncommon, Lucy, to get a phone call and say, can you look after a child? They've been removed tonight. It's only for a couple of days. because yeah. course, you can. And then after a couple of days, th things are taking a little bit longer to sort out. Are you able to keep the child yeah. for short term? And then if yeah. things working, you would say short term. And then say short term can be up to two years. And then at the end of the two years, it wouldn't be uncommon for the for them to be saying, right, we're looking for a long term placement. How's it how's it looking? You know, is this something you'd like to do? And then yeah. for the child to end up staying. Brilliant. And and the thing with emergency, sorry. So we've got we've got a question here. How is Capstone able to have a lower ratio of foster carers to social workers? Is it a different type of funding versus the local authority? Um, well, at Capstone, we're an employee owned trust, which is what John Lewis is actually. Um, but we, the pay is different. If you were going through local authority, what they tend to do is pay you for the child and a carer's fee as well. With us, it's an allowance, so it doesn't affect tax um, and it's paid as a whole. So the idea is that that fee is to support the child. OK, um, with I can't see these questions, Lynn. Uh, it's in the chat that the, the, the question is, how is Capstone able to have a lower ratio of foster carers? So how can we get one foster, uh, one social worker for eight families where local authorities, some of them have yeah, up to, you know, mid 40s? Is, I think some social workers, they would want to work for um, an independent agency because themselves they're more supportive. They would rather work for a business than a um, local authority. Um, but we wouldn't, we would, we have always got the children's best interests at heart. It may be that some local authorities are struggling to recruit foster uh, social workers. I couldn't say. But generally, you know, we will always, we would never put a child at risk. We value our foster carers and we want to give them the best support possible. And some independent fostering agencies may have a higher ratio. They may have more um, social workers to support, uh, sorry, more children that one social worker could support. But for us, that's not the way that we operate. And we would pride ourselves on the support and we wouldn't let, wouldn't let it slip. When you first get into this, mm. how do you, how do you, if you're new to foster caring, do you guys place what you expect to be short term, shorter than two years with somebody first off? Because yes. it's not just the child, is it? It's also finding out yourself. Is this something that really suits when you actually mm. try it on and do it? So do you do you that? Be, do you, you wouldn't be expected no foster carer would be expected to agree to a child long term before you'd even met them and they they've been with you for a while how could you possibly so yeah. we would recommend that a child is with you for at least a year before you say yes you know we're willing to go long term with this child because otherwise you know there is such thing as chemistry you know it's, it's yeah it, you do have to you do have to have that feeling and and the entire the thing, you know, at this point, is intellectual, experiential is going to be a whole nother beast. So, I, you know, absolutely. And equally, they're not going to think, oh, um, I know what we'll do. We'll 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 give Melanie somebody really tricky. That will really annoy her, so she won't want to be a foster <laughs> carer. You know? Certainly <laughs> not. That. We want as to a keep new carer, you. They're going to want to nurture you. They're going to, want to care yeah. for you. And of course, sometimes we don't know exactly the behaviour of the child if they've just been removed from home but as much as we can the information will be shared with you and nobody will give you a child that they don't think you're going to be able to deal with because it would be really awful for the child because we you know we, the least moves the better for yeah, children. Yeah. and and we want you to be supported as well mm. so nobody's going to set you up to fail that would just be no yeah. it's not in anyone's interests no and and when we do a fostering assessment the the, the process is so initially you'd have a conversation with somebody who would then arrange a home visit 
I'm conscious of time now, so I'm going to whiz through this, but please stop me if you've got any questions. Then if you want to progress and you've got all the information that you need, then we would start a full fostering assessment and that can take between four and six months to complete. And what that involves is various checks, references. Um, you do a two day training course, which is done online. Uh, well, it's more of a preparation course than a training mm. course. And that's part of our way to get to know you better as well. You'd also have um, usually about eight visits from a social worker and they would complete what's called a form F with you. So they will talk through your life experiences and get to know you really well, which will they will bear in mind when matching a child with you. We wouldn't want to place a child with you that would bring something up for yourself. We want to know that you're you're able enough and you're in the right place yourself to be able to foster. OK, so once we've got all of those checks back, you've completed. It's what's called a form S. You've done your training. You go to panel and that's where the decision is made. And once your decision is made, that's it. If it's a yes, then you're good to foster. So as soon as an appropriate referral comes through from the local authority, we would approach you with that of referral. You can say at no. any time during that process, at any time during the process, you can say, do you know what? It's not for me. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and that's absolutely fine. Or it might be it's not for me right now. You know, uh, I'll I'll think about it again in a year's yeah. time, in five years time. It's just about. Oh, yeah, it's just about finding out. Somebody said, how can we contact you if we want to proceed? You're going to put put that up, Lucy. At any time, if anybody wants to, oh, to yes. speak to me, you know, on a one-to-one, -one, I'm really happy to, to talk to you and answer any questions that you've got. You can get me through Capstone. So I mentioned that you'd have an initial phone call. I'm just going to share... There you go. Can you see our phone number there? Not yet. Yep. Yeah, brilliant. So yeah. you can see that if you would like to give us a call, please do so. The number is 0800 012 4004. You can email us on hello at capstone foster care and that will go into an inbox which is where foster care fostering advisors will manage your inquiry and we will call you back um, or you can visit our website www.capstonefostercare.co.uk and on there it will give you the option to complete an inquiry form so if you just pop your details in there it will ask you where you've seen where you've heard about capstone and there is an option to pop in there restless can I just reassure you, though, if you want to find out a little bit more, but you're thinking, oh, I don't know, I might be might be strong armed into doing this. You absolutely won't. You can't no. persuade anybody to be a foster carer. All you can do is give them give somebody some information and then let you decide. So please don't worry that if you give somebody your number, you're going to be bombarded with calls and because you absolutely I promise you won't. No. So we, we will attempt to make contact with you. We'll have a chat. If you say to us, I'm not ready, please call me back in six weeks, six months. Call me back tomorrow. Whatever you, Whatever's best for you, because it's really important that it is the right time for you to become a foster carer, because it is a big step, but an absolutely extremely rewarding step. And you can see, hear that in the joy in Lynn's voice. Yes, and the, the average age of a foster carer is 56. Yes. <laughs> and can I just add to that for everybody uh, anyone who's attended tonight and those who registered for the event who haven't attended for whatever reason we will email you a link this has been recorded and we will email you a link to the video if you want to re-watch but I will also include detail those contact details that um, Lucy shared with you yeah. on the email so that gives you another opportunity there'll be a click through to Capstone as well so um, yeah so if you haven't had a chance to get it down or you don't have a pen handy I you will receive an email in the next few days with those details um, so yeah so it's actually just two minutes past eight. So oh. we're, I'm afraid we've run out of time unless there's 
any other pressing questions, but um, I just really want to thank Lucy and Lynn for an, an a totally amazing event, for all the amazing experiences, Lynn, that you've shared with us tonight and the information that you've shared, Lucy and Lynn. It's just been so, so helpful. Um, thanks a million, as always, to our fabulous Restless members um, and all of the fantastic questions that you've asked, because I think every question someone asks, it's probably been burning in somebody else's mind to ask mm. too. So it's always really helpful, those questions, because it answers it for everybody. So thank you for that. Um, and all that's left for me to say is have a lovely evening. Once the event is closed, by the way, unfortunately it closes down for everyone. So on, I, I, you, even if you did want to stay around for a chat, I'm afraid you can't. But as I have said, um, all the contact details will be shared with you. So thank you all and good night.